uh, hello um, again. Uh, today is the 8th of uh, August 2023, and we'll talk now about uh, Paul Rudolph, who was born in 1918 and died in 1987, so 1997. So he was um, 79 years old uh, when he died. Let's read a little bit about him. Uh, one of the United States leading architects of the modern modernist era, uh, Paul Marvin Rudolph. He was born in October 1918, but died on the uh, August 8th. So just like Joseph Maria Aldrich, he died on, on August 8th, but in 1997. Uh, was, uh, known, was known for his contributions to modernism throughout the later half of the 20th century. He served as the chair of Yale University School of Architecture for six years and famously designed the, the Yale Art and Architecture Building, one of the earliest examples of brutalist architecture in the United States. Uh, this is what he said. An architect is a man concerned with building meaningfully. As opposed to someone who is interested in building efficiently, or sometimes even beautifully. We often apologize for being interested in meaningful buildings, but we do our profession an injustice in that way. Interesting statement, because actually he was accused, I remember in some uh, architecture magazines of the 70s, of being uh, a little bit too graphic. So maybe people didn't notice what he meant or what he could have meant by meaningful buildings. And it's interesting that he made this statement even at the expense of, of beauty or, or the beautiful. So read, reading again, an architect is a man concerned with building meaningfully, as opposed to someone who is interested in building efficiently, hello, functionalism, or sometimes even beautifully. We often apologize for being interested in meaningful buildings, but we do our profession an injustice in, in that way. Interesting statement. This was the man, um, an interesting architect and an interesting man, um, quite intense he seems to be. And you can find on the web if you search uh, Google images, photographs of Paul Rudolph, some very, very interesting uh, and provocative uh, uh, photographs. Here he is in front of the Yale Art and Architecture building that he designed, a famous building, uh, considered now a brutalist building, but uh, brutalist can be paradoxical because some people might see a, a brutalist gesture, uh, architectural gesture, but other people could see a signs of a sensitivity, which, uh, I mean, it depends on the perception. Maybe this building is more brutalist than this building, you know, from a certain point of view. Sometimes I, I think brutalism shows a sensitivity which is not apparent, is implicit. I think some brutalist architecture, uh, which, which happens to be a good architecture, is, is sensitive in a, in a more subtle way. Only the appearance is brutal or brutalist, but if you, if you investigate beyond the appearance, you might discover uh, a genuine sensitivity. Drawings, drawings by Paul Rudolph. I mean, even his drawings, I think, are quite sensitive in, in you know, I, I'm not judging so much the architecture, but the manner of drawing, it, which is almost lyrical, is it not? I mean, look at uh, especially uh, all of these two drawings, the drawing on the right. You know, it, 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 it's a sensitive drawing. But this is a building he built, uh, and uh, but even the drawing, you know, it, it shows a sensitivity. I don't know if he worked himself on this drawing. Maybe 
parts of it or some people in his office it's possible that you know it's it's a labored um, uh, drawing it's not something it's not a sketch um but i am tempted to see in his drawings uh, an awareness about uh, infinity or even um, you know the fogginess of knowledge or uh, yes there is structure yes there is geometry but there is also uh, something uh, less uh, uh, less uh, determined i don't know if i explained well what i try to to say this is the cover of a book with with his drawings the sun architecture you know architectural drawings uh, he he drew a lot and he built a lot and uh, some of his architecture is not modest you know it's uh, at that time uh, you know there wasn't uh, a lot of modesty in the world you know there was uh, a belief in uh, in progress in uh, the ability of the human being to expand to expand a belief in concrete you know so all kinds of structures were envisioned and some of them were built was he a visionary architect to an extent he was uh, because he was working at the frontier between architecture and urbanism he believed in urbanism but you will also see towards the end of this presentation um, a very interesting house rather humble house a rather modest house in a so called bad neighborhood which you wouldn't expect from such a famous architect because he was famous at, at that time uh, uh, look at this drawing done with colored pencils it's a sensitive drawing if you compare the drawings of uh, paul rudolph um, with the drawings of frank lloyd wright you see a lot of differences of course i mean paul rudolph didn't have the same relationship with nature uh, that uh, frank lloyd wright had uh, most of his buildings are uh, you know uh, well they are large public buildings uh, you, you know uh, built in, uh, in in within cities and not so much he has some buildings in 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 nature as well but without the pantheism of uh, frank lloyd wright he has a different relationship with nature you also you will uh, you're going to see also working for the sacred real a very interesting work by by um, uh, paul rudolph but right now let's let's uh, let's contemplate the drawings I think they show sensitivity. Yes, the geometry is is rather clear. Is uh, is uh, yes, he rotates. There is rotation, which uh, expresses a desire to bring bring dynamic qualities to the building and to the drawing. There is geometry, but the but the line, the colored line with colored pencils, is rather, I would say, uh, lyrical not as lyrical as Carlos Scarpa, but still lyrical. Now let's look at this building, 1940, Atkinson residence, 1940. A very, you know, uh, unheroic uh, plan. Uh, this was a very early work by him, and this wouldn't announce, you know, the the almost flamboyant uh, Paul Rudolph of later years. It's a very modest house, but he was very young. And uh, now one from 1941, the Mr. Ralph Twitchell residence. Here we see already in a very, sh in a very short time, in one year, we already see the modernization of architecture uh, you know, in uh, in his own practice, no one would say that this is not a modern building. It's a, it's a, it's clearly a modern building, and uh, the inside has a very, I would say, uh, appealing uh, structure, which is, uh, uh, it's more than just a, a Cartesian. Uh, um, you know, solution, so to speak, to the pro structural problems of the house. You can see that here is an architect 
concerned with aesthetics as well. So, so the structure becomes cultural and uh, there is a, a dynamic quality to the structure. I could almost say the structure becomes partially ornamental. And when you have the meeting between structure and ornament uh, done uh, skillfully, I think the results are uh, usually uh, very convincing. Now, with such a beautiful nature around the house, maybe you couldn't insult nature with a simplistic building. It had to have some complexity. Again, uh, uh, this this work was done just one year later, maybe even less than one year than, than the other building, the first one that we saw. Paul Rudolph. I like very much the way he solved the, the structural uh, uh, problem and especially the, the, the structural expression of structure. You know, again, it becomes aesthetical. It's not just structure, you know, a raw structure without an aesthetical <clears throat> concern. Because, because, because Paul Rudolph was an architect. And as an architect, he had to have some exaltation because this is what Walter Gropio said. The artist, and he included the architect here, is an exalted craftsman. So without exaltation, a certain kind of exaltation, you cannot be an artist. And I would say you cannot truly really be an architect because Paul Valéry was right when he said, only the builder who places a stone above another stone and makes them sing deserves the name an architect or Eupalinos, as Paul Valery said. 1941, the Ralph Twitchell residence, designed with Ralph Twitchell, with the, with the, with the owner, featured in Architectural Forum in September 1947. As of 1969, the owners were, ah, this is a, uh, Anyway, I don't know very well why I included this description, but it's interesting that, I mean, interesting, damaged by fire, the house was dismantled and put into storage in 2007. The land was unbuilt as of 2013, bottom photo. Uh, what is this? This is another house from 1950. I I, I will not read the whole, um, the whole uh, text because it could, um, it could uh, interrupt the fluidity of the presentation. And we have more than 300 pictures with the work of this pro prolific architect. But this is also a, a, an interesting house that shows the skill of this architect. You know, it's, 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 uh, it's uh, you know, uh, almost like a pavilion. It's, it's, it's a house which is not ample, but you show, you see the skill of the architect. Um, again and again, we have tradition and we have innovation. We have continuity and we have the break that innovation uh, uh, you know, uh, advocates and takes care of. Why is it that important architects try to distinguish themselves from what preceded them? Well, it's the advancement of life. You know, it's 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 normal in a way to you move forward, and you cannot move forward if you are stuck in the past. You have to know the past. You have to be have even affection towards the past, but moving forward meaning means um, breaking new grounds. No, and you break new grounds through innovation. The Frank and Ann H. Parcels residence in uh, Michigan, 1967. This is a, um, you know uh, uh, a trademark uh, building by uh, Paul Rudolph. Already we have here a mature Paul Rudolph maybe a little bit too sure of himself. Although 
the variations of the of the volumes of the house, you could also see maybe, if not Hamletian dilemmas, but uh, you know some uh, uh, concerns with um, you know uh, various uh, uh, various interpretations of what a building should be like. There is, there is a, this is not a monolith, it's rather a building composed of various parts. The scale is rather, without too much modesty, but uh, uh, it, it's, it's a signature building by Paul Rudolph. We are going to see similar things by him, but by 1967, it was built in 1967, yes, um, he was already a, a mature architect. A house, not uh, for everybody, not for the proletarians. It's interesting, the public dimension of a private house. It sounds, uh, you know, paradoxical and almost oxymoronic. No, what do you mean the publicness of a private house? But I think even in the case of a public house, uh, of a private house, we can talk about publicness. But you see that there are many chairs, no? This is for a family, no? And they're guests. So there is an element of publicness even within... Um, private house. This is a rather, you know, not the largest um, private house, but a larger, a bigger uh, private house. The dynamics within the house you know, the negotiations between the members of the family that inhabits a house, uh, bring to the fore the, the problems having to do with the dialectics between the private and the public, even though it's a house inhabited by one family. But between the members of the family, there are approxima approximations of the larger dialectics between the private and the public. In essence, it's about multiplicity in unity. And we have here unity, uh, we also have multiplicity. And the living room is, is, the, is the vortex where you know, various individuals meet and interact. 1967, again, Tracy Towers Public Housing in Bronx, in the Bronx, in New York housed 300, uh, 500 residents per tower. Look at that. Personally, I think it's, 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 it's good architecture. You know, it, it has, uh, it has uh, an ethos of uh, heroic um, ambitions. Uh, yes, it's concrete, but there are also curved elements. The, 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 it's sculptural. It's very sculptural, the Tracy Tower, Towers, 1967, uh, Paul Rudolph, New York City. I, I, I wish I had more pictures with this work. The Herbert Green Residence, 1968, a another large building. And, uh, you know, uh, 1968, no? So almost 60 years ago, he built a building which, uh, could have been built today and considered, uh, you know, avant-garde. A little bit too graph graphic, graphically convenient for my taste, but it's still an interesting house. And uh, almost, uh, you know, uh, a little bit science fiction, almost. And we had seen many, you know, even outrageous things uh, in our time, and yet, no one would say that this building doesn't have a certain uh, formal courage with its slanted surfaces. Mm. 
He was an innovator. Uh, a very large uh, plot of land around the house. But the house, I would say, uh, in its ahistorical way, is still uh, an invitation to be freshly modern. Paul Rudolph. An architect who is not so fashionable these days, but he had his time of glory in the 60s, 70s, maybe early. Well, in postmodernism, I think he was a little bit eclipsed by the, you know, the, the concerns with the historicism. And I'm glad he didn't, uh, uh, he refused to be involved with the borrowing from, uh, from history. I mean, this, this is a building uh, which is uh, which is almost uh, non-referential, uh, historically speaking, if we are to refer to the wording of uh, Valerio Olciati, something that I don't do, do with great pleasure. But um, on the other hand, I would say the aplomb of the house, which is not very vertical, is rather well, it's uh, slanted. Now it's between horizontal and vertical, uh, but it is assertive. You you can tell that those uh, diagonal elements aspire towards something that is uh, transcending um, limitations in general. It's a dynamic. The diagonals create a dynamic architecture, and, and he was uh, very fond of. of, of uh, of, uh, of uh, diagonals. 1970, another residence. Uh, 1970. Look at this one. You know, it's sur another surprise from Paul Rudolph. Uh, there are some formalist gestures here, but architecture cannot uh, ignore form. For God's sake, I mean, you know, you have form and function. You have to have both. Although, as I said, he was considered a little bit too conveniently graphic. Uh, there was a time then when he was, uh, you know, kind of uh, placed on the same uh, pedestal of fame with Oscar Niemeyer. Oscar Niemeyer himself was considered sometimes a, a little bit too conveniently playing with forms, just like uh, Paul Rudolph was. But um, I think that both architects deserve, continue to deserve uh, attention and maybe even affection. Again, we see the manipulation of structure in uh, capricious ways, in, in the sense of, uh, of a structure that becomes ornament partially, not, uh, uh, not uh, excessively, partially. And not everywhere the, the, the house is, uh, uh, you know, uh, too capricious. The Oriental, Oriental Masonic Garden Housing, New Haven, Connecticut, commissioned in 1968, uh, 148 prefab units. Residences were grouped in fours with a lower module containing living spaces and a module above with bedrooms. They were expensive to build, they leaked, they were ugly, people hated them, and they were destroyed in 1981 a mere 11 years later. So you see Paul Rudolph also uh, had moments of um, being, uh, you know, almost considered an enemy of the people. But personally, I regret that these houses were destroyed. Yes, maybe, you know, in the United States, uh, this kind of collectivism is not very uh, appreciated. Uh, but uh, I think, if I look at this picture and there was a more abundant vegetation, you know, lots of trees and the ivy climbing on these units, I think 
I think this complex of buildings would have been okay. I don't think they, in my opinion, even the worst mistake by a good architect is preferable to, a, let's say, a best achievement of a mediocre architect. I think, and I, it's regrettable that this was destroyed after ele only 11 years. Um, sorry about the quality of the picture here. I, I regret I, I, I should have had more pictures with this because I, I have affection for, uh, uh, you, know, you know, things that are not, that, that do not exist any longer. And you could say fate was unfair. I, 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 I very strongly feel that if nature was allowed here to, to um, uh, you know, negotiate with the architecture and have more plants and trees and so on, um, it, it would have been, uh, it would have been, uh, it would have had a different, uh, a different uh, fate. Now the Paul Rudolph and Ernst Wagner townhouse uh, it was the home, it is the home of the Paul Rudolph Heritage Foundation, 1989 in Manhattan. Uh, he lived in this house um, with his partner, Ernst uh, Wagner. This is a drawing of the house and this is, um, this is the building. Um, it is a foundation there, the Paul Rudolph Foundation, which helps, I, I like to imagine architects, maybe even students in architecture. You see here elements of what I call ca architectural capriciousness. No, it's, it's important, you know, it's again, it's, it's not everything is objective. There are also subjective elements and these subjective elements, uh, meandering as they are, create uh, the unexpected and, uh, you know, aesthetical surprises. The interior, he had his office there. I read that he was, uh, he had his bedroom at the top level and he was looking uh, downwards through openings in the floors towards uh, the sections of the house that, uh, uh, no, were occupied by his uh, practice, architectural practice. There is a certain level of exuberance, no? Is that uh, exaltation that um, Walter Gropius mentioned, that the artist is an exalted craftsman? You need a certain level of exaltation in order to move beyond of being merely, I shouldn't say merely, being only um, a, a craftsperson. But Walter Grop, you said very correctly that both the artist and the craftsman are rooted in a craft, in craft. And the only difference between them is that the artist is an exalted craftsman but he or she is still a craftsperson, but exalted. Catherine Cornell and Guthrie McClintic residence, he, uh, this was his intervention on an existing building, right? So why should uh, a new intervention just try to mimic, uh, you know, a placid uh, relationship with what was there before and with the neighbors? No. This is the assertion of his time. Remember what uh, uh, was inscribed on the secessionist uh, building in Vienna, you know, by Joseph Maria Olbrich. To each time it's art, and we could include architecture here, and to art is freedom. So this building uh, was built uh, earlier. This also was built earlier. And here comes Paul Rudolph, with his own intervention in his own time and with the freedom that art needs, doesn't matter when it is uh, acting. So uh, we should try to do the same in our own works. What is this, 1963? Eh? I don't know what this is. This is an interesting, uh, another 
public building by um, uh, Paul Rudolph um, in Dartmouth. Um, now look here, you know, it's, it's, could you say that it's just structure? No, it's structure and ornament. Structure is, uh, is uh, challenged by um, formal elements which bring richness into, into, the, uh, into the architectonic expression. And we see the same impetus, the same longing for the infinite in a way, which we remember that house with a diagonal with slanted surfaces. Here we see the same Elan Vital without um, slanted uh, surfaces, without diagonals. Well, there are here and there, you know, like small diagonals, which are necessary sometimes in order to escape uh, the predictability of the Cartesian system. Yes, he was an exalted craftsman. He was an artist. We cannot avoid the, the, the word. Again, concrete. But who says that architecture does not benefit from sculpture, sculpturalness might be a little wrong because, or maybe not so a little, you know, sculpturalness adds to the building. You know, it becomes interesting, it becomes engaging, it becomes uh, alive, dynamic. It's also interesting what he does outside of the building with a quasi-architectural quasi landscape or landscaping. Um, we can see also a governmental building in, in, in Boston where even Baroque elements show up. Surprisingly, no? who would have thought that uh, you could have a meeting between modernity and uh, uh, Baroque, uh, uh, Baroque elements. But we see them here too. You know, you look at the plan and, 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 and these diagonals uh, in, in the landscape uh, advocate uh, freedom and uh, even idiosyncratic freedom. You know, they, they seem to to even uh, invite dangerously, uh, uh, you know, uh, disharmony or uh, uh, yeah, formal chaos, if there is such a thing. You know, it's 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 it's, it's the rebellious rebelliousness of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of a form which does not want to accept the restrictions of Cartesianism. And we see interlocking elements that uh, have some kind of a Baroque viscerality, I would say. Maybe it would be interesting to, to talk about, uh, you know, uh, Paul Rudolph in terms of, uh, uh, you know, uh, tensions between uh, modernity and, uh, and something else, which could be, as I said, and maybe not, it's not so explicit here in the pictures, some uh, uh, Baroque, uh, I mean, I'm talking about uh, a constant of aesthetics because, you know, the historical Baroque period happened when it happened. I'm talking about a constant element, a Baroque modernity. And this fragmentation, the visceralization of architecture, in my opinion, is also could be traced back to some kind of a, a Baroque impulse. I'm thinking aloud, but uh, uh, this is my intuition. 
you know that that it would be interesting to to evaluate the works of Paul Rudolph and not only him but we talk about him now in terms of uh, uh, you know um, baroque visceralization within modernity now the Orange County Government Center from 1963 uh, he even here we see you know on the right side of the plan you know the uh, certain fragmentation that that could be associated with the complexities of, uh, of uh, Baroque architecture. And even here, when we look at the plan, uh, this, is, this is not a, a functionalist, uh, strict functionalist, uh, strict uh, Cartesian uh, architecture. It's not. And we see the same aggregation. It's an aggregate building it's an aggregation of, of um, a, a multitude of elements that come together. So it's not a monolithical building, you know, conceived from the top down, but rather, or it's both, uh, uh, is crystallized uh, both from the small towards the big and from the big towards the small. So that's why I say there is multiplicity in unity. A, a rendering section he, he used to make these uh, renderings with um, you know uh, uh, I mean sectional renderings with shadows and everything now of course uh, working digitally uh, this is done automatically by the software but at that time, not too many architects, you know, created such, uh, you know, rendered uh, uh, sections through their buildings, where you even saw shadows and so on. So it's an artistic, a perspectival section with some level of artistry because of the because of the, the, the you know the the consideration given to to light and shadows not bad not bad, a governmental building, but it's it's not a it's not a governmental building that uh, <clears throat> attempts to crush you with its authority. And I think here is the <clears throat> the idiosyncratic secessionist artist. You know, I mean, he's on the side <clears throat> on the side not of authority, but on the side of freedom and on the side of the passerby. <clears throat> of the men of the street, of the men without qualities. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> men uh, without qualities actually having a lot of qualities, but maybe not recognizable as such. <clears throat> uh, of course, I was referring to the title of the book by Robert Musil, uh, the Austrian um, uh, writer. I like this building. You know, I wish more governmental buildings would have this kind of visceralization of, 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 of uh, architecture and this kind of uh, fragmentation. It's not a dwarf dwarfing uh, building <clears throat> exactly because of these uh, um, you know uh, uh, small elements which compose the whole. I wonder what the policeman thinks, you know, in the proximity of such a building, which almost disintegrates itself. I mean, it remains crystallized, but at the same time, seems to almost want to disintegrate. There were some interesting buildings built uh, uh, built uh, across the United States um, that 
deserve perhaps a new uh, appraisal. The interior is also enticing, you know, because of the, uh, not really porosity, but uh, you see light enters um, through various uh, uh, places within the building. And then there is this communication between various levels. Um, so again, it's, 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 it's about uh, <clears throat> fighting, uh, um, you know, uh, potentially oppressive uh, monolithical uh, quality through fragmentation, what I call the visceralization of architecture. Otherwise, the, <clears throat> the material, the construction, constructive material is, is the same, you know, it's uh, exposed concrete, but because of the way light enters the building and the communication between various levels of the building, um, the feeling is not oppressive. I wouldn't call it a brutalist building. Uh, Charles Dana Creative Art Center for Colgate University, 1963-1966. Well, I, I think architecture does matter. And, uh, you know, you, uh, if it is a building for art or a building for any, any kind of um, department or, you know, or, or a field of, of study, I think if the building is, uh, is uh, uh, passionately advocating uh, moving forward, as I think this building does, uh, at least to a certain extent, uh, this has a good effect on the students. It does matter if the building you enter is, uh, is placid and uh, insignificant and without Elan Vital, and if it is a building that has some, uh, uh, you know, uh, soul and some uh, passion in it, I think, I think those values are transmitted to the users. Again, who would say that this is not a sensitive drawing? A typical Paul Rudolph um, drawing, probably done by some people uh, or someone in, the, in his office. I wouldn't call his architecture perfect. Like for example, here, I think that this horizontal element uh, is rather, rather monolithical, although it's just a part of the building, but I find it a little bit uh, too willful. I'm talking about this. So maybe <clears throat> the balance between uh, l'esprit de geometrie, the spirit of geometry and the spirit of fineness, l'esprit de finesse, is not uh, is not perfect. I I find this this part a little bit too deterministic, too willful for my own subjective uh, uh, evaluation a bit. I prefer this fragmentation. Well, a uh, balance between them, but I, I, I still think that here uh, there is a little bit too much will, too much determination, too, too much, uh, yeah, uh, determinism. I wouldn't mind if some ivy climbed on the building, but there are interesting things happening, you know. Um, He was not the only architect who worked like this at that time. You had uh, uh, Gottfried Böhm in Germany, and uh, there was uh, uh, the, there were architects in even in Switzerland who built with um, exposed concrete, not in a very dissimilar way from what we look at here. 
This is a signature element in his architecture, his handling of concrete. You know, even the fact that he didn't, I mean, it would be interesting to compare the handling of concrete by Paul Rudolph as opposed to, let's say, Tadao Ando. Tadao Ando loves uh, polished uh, concrete, the trademark Tadao Ando concrete, while uh, um, Paul Rudolph liked to have this texture, you know, it's like corduroy concrete, you know, and uh, this shows a certain disposition towards bringing a, a certain sensitivity to, to the conglomerate that concrete was, if we are to refer to what Frank Lloyd Wright said, that concrete is a conglomerate. The Christian Science Center, not bad in its own way. And we see again the treatment of the concrete, which which has, um, uh, you know, it, 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 it even invites somehow the, the dialogue with the elements. You know, it it it, it is a skin which is not which is not uh, uh, polished, and I I like this fact. It has a character. It's concrete. And look at the entrance door into the Christian Science Organization. So, was I wrong when I when I saw possible relationships between uh, the architecture of Paul Rudolph and the uh, Baroque art or Baroque architecture? Well, uh, this uh, um, gateway or entrance door into the building is Baroque through and through. A modern Baroque. Not afraid to use color either. Now the Boston, Boston Government Service Center, a large building, an initial sketch. Uh, and uh, you wonder, you know, when you look at this sketch, uh, Please remember what he sketched here, then we'll see the plan of the building. Where here, in the end, uh, the, the lines of, of the landscaping of this part of the building, of the outside of the building, do have uh, explicit uh, references to what we call the Baroque uh, but we already see here in this early drawing in pencil that there are forces here, aesthetical forces that uh, seem to coagulate uh, a Baroque tendency, in my opinion. But, but these, these uh, incipient uh, sketches do show a, a, a sensitive architect. Uh, uh, look, at, look at this. This is almost, almost Hans Pelsig. This is almost expressionist architecture. I'm, I'm almost sure that Hans Pelsig, um, the expressionist German architect, would have loved this drawing by, um, by Paul Rudolph. And this is the plan. And I find even more interesting somehow what is happening outside of the building than inside. Again, this is not Baroque, it is. And there are 
small parts as well that could be considered uh, at least to an extent baroque and look at this Paul Rudolph It's a large building. It's a you know a, a governmental building, and yet the sensitivity shown in the interstitial spaces and the spaces outside of the building per se uh, show um, artistic concerns that are quite explicit. I know people consider this architecture to be a brutalist architecture, but I think we live in, in strange times in a way. We are afraid of what is heroic. Um, now, it's, it's good to, to, to turn our back on, uh, or our backs on, on uh, false uh, heroism, on fake heroes, but I, I think if, if the heroic impulse has a certain level of genuineness, I think we should embrace it. If it's not arrogant, if it's not an inflated chest that says, I, am, uh, I know everything, I do everything, I always succeed, I am the success, I am success par excellence. No. A combination between um, between um, courage and modesty uh, is uh, is to be appreciated. I think. Again, I feel that 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 the buildings of Paul Rudolph would benefit from ivy or trees, vegetation in general. What I see here, I don't know how it is today, but in this picture. I think uh, you know this. Uh, this uh, these plants are too modest, too small. I, I would, I would, I would see here, you know, nature invading the building, and it would be, it would be for the benefit of uh, of everybody. I would say, why not allow ivy to grow on the building? In the spirit of, uh, you know, the landscaping is interesting, shows clearly that you had, uh, you know, uh, a rich imagination and that he, he wanted uh, to escape the rigidity of a uh, of, uh, less sensitive approach. There are, there are episodes of uh, drama within the building, like this one, because of the light that comes from above. Now, the Yale Art and Architecture Building in Connecticut, the, the famous uh, building that we saw a picture of uh, with him, uh, uh, unfortunately, I'm trying to go back to, sorry, uh, no, unfortunately, I went too far and I couldn't find that uh, picture from the corner. Uh, so let's go with what we have. So the Yale, Yale and Art Architecture uh, building in, in Connecticut. Um, I, I'm not sure if some newer interventions were not made here. Somehow I feel that this this seems to belong to a different architectural language. I, I could be wrong. Um, I don't know.
This is the plan. It's interesting that this um, hybrid uh, functioning of the building where you have, you see, architectural design and then you have painting above. So you have, you know, the painters and the architects meeting, uh, you know, um, living together or, you know, studying together in the same building, art and architecture. Why not? Uh, it would be probably to, for the benefit of both instead of having them separated. This also happens at Cooper Union in New York, where, well, there, there is even an additional uh, uh, third, uh, you know, because it's the, the school of, of architecture and painting and engineering. Interesting um, uh, trinity or triad. But to me, when I contemplate the works of, of any important architect, I see a, a desire to combine order with disorder or with freedom. So we're in movement and we see it here too. There is structure, there is order, but there is also a, um, you know, a, a, an opposite force at work that seems to problematize the you know, the, the certitudes of, uh, of, the, of the first system, the, you know, the ordering one. So I guess we could say, uh, referring in a simplistic way to Apollo and Dionysus, that we need both. We need both gods, the god of light and order and the god of intoxication. Archaeology of the of the digital, probably the exhibition um, of, um, curated probably by uh, Greg Lynn, who teaches still, well, for many years now in Vienna, in Vienna. So this is the building by by Paul Rudolph at Yale. An intriguing uh, naming, no, of the exhibition, Archaeology of the Digital. Yeah, he is Paul Rudolph in front of his building. I mean, designed by him. And a detail of his concrete, his trademark concrete. So like the bark of a tree, he wanted his concrete to have that texture. You know, <clears throat> he would not have been happy with the uh, Tadao Ando concrete. No, not Paul Rudolph, a different man, a different temperament. Maybe he felt just like Frank Lloyd Wright that 
concrete was somehow an impure material, a conglomerate, as Frank Lloyd Wright called it. So he tried to bring some organic quality to the uh, to the concrete by creating this, uh, uh, you know, um, fascia. This this uh, uh, you know this uh, this. Uh, texture of the of the of the building in contact with the exterior the building becomes animated by these um, stripes this is a very interesting work at a a emory emory university the canon chapel at the candler candler school of theology Because I think we can see here that he was also able to be a contextualist. Uh, so he worked with existing buildings. Actually, the, the again the uh, the you know the adventure of working for the sacred realm. Let's call it so. No, it's it's for a theological uh, for a school of theology. It's a chapel. Uh, I, I think shows a, a kind of a different Paul Rudolph. A Paul Rudolph was not indifferent to um, uh, to assume, uh, you know, uh, an attempt to to handle spiritual matters through architecture. And I, I think he did it, uh, uh, if not in a spectacular way. I think he did it uh, with a with a. Uh, with a with a respect, with a reticence, even that uh, approaching the sacred uh, probably deserves. The, so the, there were existing buildings, and within the existing uh, context, he created a building that is his architecture, but is not. Uh, you know, insulting to the to the neighbors, to the to the context, and, and I like this drawing very much. It has numbers. It has you know, it has uh, uh, notations that have to do with the measurable parts of architecture. But the drawing is rather uh, it's, it's it's sensitive, and it's it even has a certain uh, I would say. Uh, uh, um, uh, fragility. I, I don't know where Paul, Paul, Paul Rudolph was situating himself in terms of uh, faith or spirituality, but looking at these drawings, uh, I do not see an arrogant man who, uh, you know, dismisses uh, God or dismisses. Uh, uh, you know what is called faith. I, I see a I see a, a hesitant man, and the, the, in, in these hesitations, I, I see uh, a sensitivity which probably was uh, was deeper than uh, maybe other evaluations of his work could have arrived at. I, I like these drawings very much. Another chapel, 
1960. So it was built, it was created after Ronchamp by Le Corbusier. Paul Rudolph. And we see again the, the different aesthetical disposition towards the outside of the building. I almost feel tempted to psychoanalyze a little bit uh, Paul Rudolph. And look at this drawing, you know, and it was done without computers. It's very, it's very rigorous, but also sensi sensitive. Space analysis. Paul Rudolph, another chapel. The mystery of God. The colonnade in Singapore from 1980. Uh, another, I would say, uh, good drawing, pencil drawing by uh, Paul Rudolph. And uh, we'll see the buildings in this uh, Switzerland of Southeast Asia, as Singapore is uh, described these days. This drawing also shows, I would say, sensitivity. And, and vulnerability, I would say. Plenty of columns. We see the same fragmentation that we saw earlier in some other works, as if he was afraid of, a, of an excessive uh, monolithic uh, expression. It's not a modest building in terms of height, but in terms of plan, you see this uh, labyrinthical uh, uh, mental disposition, which uh, problematizes in a way the, you know, the, uh, the very verticality of the building. And the fragmentation that I mentioned can be seen also in the elevations of the building. So not just in plan. We saw this drawing and now some pictures of the building.
there is plenty of money in Singapore, so important architects are invited continuously to build there. And uh, Paul Rudolph was one of them. Of course, these, these apartments are not for proletarians. An office and shopping complex, the concourse, also in Singapore, 1981-1994. The drawing, we saw it already. Interesting plan, no? I mean, you say that this is a, you know, a rather predictable tower, but when you look at the plan and you see how each apartment is um, uh, individualized and, and, and uh, segregated from the other apartments, so it's tentacular. It's a building that... Uh, uh, doesn't care too much about losses of energy. Of course, there are a lot, of, lots of uh, exterior uh, exterior walls. Maybe in Singapore it's not so dramatic. Um, it's a warmer warmer climate. Uh, plus, this building, I'm sure, benefits from um, you know uh, total air conditioning. This architecture by Paul Rudolph from his later years, I, I find it a little bit uh, too mundane for my taste. Um, almost uh, a little bit too close to what I might call, um, you know, a, a commercial architecture. Of, of course, of a high caliber, expensive, high end and all the rest. Uh, the total residence, 1983-1984, uh, this is a building, um, just a second, it's for, uh, I forgot exactly, for someone working in the, uh, in the, the aeronautic uh, industry, a large residence with an industrial uh, heritage, so to speak, uh, around the building. And I think the contextualism of, of, of Paul Rudolph is rather... Uh, convincing. I like uh, the you know this section through the building and the drawing uh, and also the plan. Again, very sensitive drawings. Um, they made me think a little bit of some sketches and drawings by Frank Lloyd Wright, but again, a very different architect, Paul Rudolph. And we see the same uh, attempt to, uh, um, uh, you know, to um, uh, problematize, to sabotage the monolithic uh, quality uh, of the of the work. That's why we we see these fragments that come together, uh, and um, they compose a whole. They compose a oneness, but you also distinguish the the the, com, the uh, uh, contributing uh, individuality so to speak i like this building because because of its um, 
references to the, the industrial buildings around it, you know, like this, which belong to some industry, and then the building is here. So I particularly like it in this light and from this angle. Um, And the fragmentation and the visceralization of architecture can, fi can find uh, another expression even in the handling of these uh, stones at the base of the, of, the, of the building. We're a little bit far away from the building, but I see no contradiction because it's, it's the same attempt to bring together uh, uh, you know, uh, various parts to, to create a unity without neglecting uh, what I call multiplicity. So you have the many stones coming together or rocks, and then in the building we see parts that also come together to create a whole. It's an interesting building by, uh, uh, by Paul Rudolph. Because on one hand we have nature, here, we also have industry, the buildings that we looked at. We have stones. We have the references to the biography of the owner, who, if I remember correctly, he worked in, uh, in, uh, in, you know, in the field of, uh, I don't know, planes and uh, having something to do with, uh, with that field uh, of industry. It's not a small building, it's a large building, but uh, it has a certain level of unexpectedness and freshness. The Bond Center in Hong Kong, 1984-1988, again, playing with the octagon, a deformed octagon, uh, you know, um, suggested uh, through the positioning of these round columns, And the towers, uh, the quite uh, you know uh, imposing uh, through their scale. I don't think is one of his best works because again I think the 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 the, the tension between uh, or the balance or the imbalance between the spirit of geometry and the spirit of fineness. Uh, they, and then they are a little bit mundane. And there you can see the system uh, a little bit too explicitly. But they do stand out. They do have personality. And um, there is some personality also, artistic personality in the, in the drawings on the yellow tracing paper. A lot of glass, of course, no window opens. Air conditioning, air conditioning, air conditioning. Paul Rudolph. There is a certain formalism here that uh, could be accused of being uh, rather facile, but some interesting pictures can still be taken, like this one, for example, with the interstitial space between the two towers. Some kind of a positive erosion, if I am to call it so, but, but too much glass. But on the other hand, the glass you see itself is fragmenting into small, um, you know, uh, sections or, or small elements, but still together they create ample glass surfaces. In Indonesia, 1994, an uh, interesting building inspired a little bit, or maybe more than a little bit, by the traditional uh, Indonesian um, uh, architecture. And this one from 1998, this is, a, this is a building in the United States 
which I find uh, intriguing because it's it's in an unglamorous area. Uh, you look at the houses on the right side. You know, these are rather modest houses. In a it looks like a modest, um, you know, environment, if I'm not mistaken. And here, uh, here there was uh, Paul Rudolph, you know, a glamorous figure of architecture. I don't know if by 1998 he was still considered so. This is the house. And it's actually a very interesting house because you wouldn't expect, you know, if, if this building was in Japan, I would have not, I would not have been surprised. But in the United States and with an, um, you know, with a neighboring building like this one, you wouldn't expect this kind of uh, bunker, this kind of, uh, you know, bulwark of resistance, uh, you know. Uh, so it does surprise me this house that um, Paul Rudolph built and uh, I, I actually in a, in a positive way because it shows a disponibility towards uh, a uh, kind of architecture which I knew, I would not have expected. We saw his more opulent villas, but this kind of you know rather small house, uh, it would have been difficult to to imagine coming from the pencil, so to speak, of uh, Paul Rudolph. In the 1990s, in the last decade of his life, Rudolph explored the application of traditional building forms with his modernist aesthetic in large-scale projects in Singapore, Hong Kong, and Indonesia. On August 8, 1997, Paul Rudolph passed away in New York City from mesothelioma, a cancer that usually results from exposure to asbestos. At the time of his death, he was working on plans for a new town of 250,000 people in Indonesia, a private residence, a chapel, an office complex in Singapore. So this is the town that he was working on the project, the Pantai Timur Surabaya town uh, for 2,500, uh, 2,050,000 people. Uh, and we end now the presentation uh, on, on, on his works on this day when he died, but some years ago on August uh, 8th. And again, I think the, the drawing shows skill and uh, uh, discreet, uh, uh, you know, uh, sensitivity, if you consider the color and the lines. Paul Rudolph, thank you.